This is going to be a first of a few videos about the principle of strong induction. And I just want to go back to the basic idea of mathematical induction and think about why does induction work? Um, so usual way of doing it is we have a base case, P of 1. And we know the core of the induction proof is going to be something that says if we know a certain case of, P of our statement P, then that implies the next case. So in particular, if we know P of 1 is true, so case 1 of some statement about sequences or summations or factoring or something like that, and we know that if someone tells us that and gives us that as a freebie, I can get to the next case, then I also then know the next case. So I know P of 2. OK. And now, suppose I can get from that case to the next case. So it's not assuming circularly that I know P of 3 already. It's that if someone did most of the work already and tells me P of 2 is true, can I get to P of 3? Okay, That certainly is going to tell me um, that P of 3 is going to be true because I know P of 2 is true. But let's suppose that P of 3 is a little bit harder to actually prove and I need a little bit more help. I want to say, you know what, can you spot me P of 1 as well? So in other words, can you say, given both P of 1 and P of, true, P of 2, can I prove P of 3? That should be a little easier. I'm allowed to assume P of 1 and P of 2, and maybe with that much help, I can get to P of 3. Well, is that going to be OK? Well, yeah, because I do know P of 1, and I do know P of 2. There's no harm in saying, you know, can you spot me P of 1, because you already have. We already know that's true, okay? So if I know this is this, okay, so given P of 1 and P of 2 to work with, if I can get to P of 3, the next rung of the ladder, then given that I already know P of 1 and P of 2, then I've got P of 3. So I know P of 3. Okay, so now suppose, so the usual induction would be, uh, I know that if you... Tell me how to get P of 3 and verify that P of 3 is true, case 3 of our statement, I get to P of 4, then certainly, yeah, I've got P of 4 as well. Okay, I'll put a little check mark there. But there's no need to make it that hard on myself. What if I, uh, oh, that's a P of 3. What if all I know is that I can prove case 4 of the statement with the help of knowing P of 1 and P of 2 and P of 3? That's a weaker thing to, to uh, assume that I can do. I'm not forced to ignore the truth of P of 1 and P of 2 and only work with P of 3 being true. I'm allowed to use all of these statements to get to P of 4. Well, can I get... Do I know P of 4? Absolutely. Because I can assume P of 1, P of 2, and P of 3. And that gets me to P of 4. And so on. So this principle of strong induction is that I'm allowed to use in my induction step any previous case. And that's totally OK. Because by the time I get to P of, let's say, I want to prove P of 317, I can assume that I know P of 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 all the way up through P of 316 are all true. Okay. So maybe it turns out that there's some clever way to show that knowing that it's true for 200 and 247 and 314, all those together, giving me, if you give me all those facts, if I can true, prove P of 317, that's totally okay because I know these. These are all previous cases. So it's really the idea of if I can reduce to any previous case or even any combination of previous cases, then it's going to work. So how does that get written up? Okay, this is, an, this is a slightly different use of the K and N terminology. It's a little bit different use of the K and N terminology. So here's the principle. Okay, suppose that um, no matter what n is, it's a positive integer though, okay, um, given p of 1, 
through p of n minus 1. I'm going to tighten this up a little bit, make it more like what the book says. So that no matter what n is, given p of n, 1 through p of n minus 1, I can show p of n. Then, in fact, p of n is true for all n. Okay, so here's the official statement in the book, and we'll see that it's really just equivalent to this, and it's got a, there's a kind of a clever little trick to it as well. Okay, um, so if for every natural number n, and those start at one from in our book, no big deal. Okay. Uh, the following statement is true, okay, and it's an implication. P of k is true for all k less than n. I'll put that in parentheses. Implies P of n is true. Okay, so it's a little bit hard to parse, I think, but it's really equivalent to this, but we're just putting in a dummy variable instead of making a list. So suppose that no matter what n is, uh, that I can prove p of n with the help of, or with the, the ability to assume that p of k is true for all previous k. So that's the p of 1 through p of n minus 1. This is really saying, given p of 1 through p of n minus 1, this is just saying, given that I'm allowed to assume p of k for all k less than n, if when I'm allowed to assume that, I can get to the very next one, the next one that I don't know, p of n, then in fact, if that's true no matter what n is, if I can always get to the next case given all previous cases, not just the immediate previous case, um, and I box myself out of room, then p of n really is true for all n. Okay. So again, one more time, if I can get to a case given, the, assuming the truth of all the previous cases, then I can say it's true for all cases. Now, notice um, there's no base case. There's no explicit base case here, and that's really kind of a trick. There really still is kind of a base case, but it's actually subsumed in the very first case of this. Notice this is supposed to be true when n equals 1. Okay. And what am I allowed to assume when n equals 1? I'm allowed to assume the truth of everything before that, but there is no natural number before 1 in our way of counting the natural numbers. So this, there's nothing I am allowed to assume, so I actually have to assume, I have to actually know that p1 is true on its own. Okay, So it's one of those things that mathematicians tend to like because it's very clean, but almost everybody else doesn't because they're like, eh, wait, you dropped the special part of it. And mathematician says, oh, the special part is cleverly included in the general case. Well, you kind of have to see that. It automatically includes uh, the knowledge that P of 1 is true without any help. So there are going to be rare cases where you prove strong induction, and even what you're doing, kind of, this falls out automatically as well, and the base case falls out automatically. But I would never trust that. I would never, ever trust that. Uh, you might as well do the base case. If you can't do the base case separately, then you probably don't understand what you're doing. Okay. So one more thing. I don't want this to be too long about the generalities before we get to the, intro the, the specific examples. Um, we're using k and n in a little bit of a different way here. We're still using the letters k and n, but it's a little bit of a different use. Um, before, it was k was the, um, the temporary variable that made us rem remember that we're in the induction step. Okay? Here, n is really playing that role, and k has a new role. k is a label for which statement or statements are you using to get to the next one. Okay, so I'm following the book here, but it's, it might be a little confusing because it's a really different use of um, this, this, the K and N here. We didn't have any use for the K in this sense before because we always knew which statement we were relying on, the immediate previous one. Here, it's a label that lets us talk about, oh, which one did we use? Did we use n over 2 or n minus 7 or uh, statements 2, 3, 5, 7, and 9, something like that? 
Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that rule of the, the letters. In the next video, we'll apply this with, um, with an example about Fibonacci sequence.